consider one plus one dimensional quantum electrodynamics. How many people here have considered one plus one dimensional quantum electrodynamics? Good, you can go to sleep. Um, why would we consider one plus one dimensional quantum electrodynamics? The reason is I want to illustrate the very, very simplest example of vacuum decay, bubble nucleation, in basically its oldest um, uh, existence, the creation of electron-positron pairs in a one-dimensional electric field. The mathematics of it, the physics of it, is extremely similar to the mathematics and physics of other kinds of vacuum decays. And this one is so simple that it will only take me five minutes to do on the blackboard. Five minutes probably means 10 minutes. OK, so here's the setup. We have one plus one dimensional electrodynamics. I think I'll do it in the uh, center board here. Electromagnetism, except that there is no magnetic field in one plus one dimensions. There's only electric fields. And the electric field is completely determined by Gauss's law. There are no photons or no um, electromagnetic waves. There's only the static Coulomb field. And so given the charges, you can write down rather immediately what the electric field is. And what I want to do is start with a situation, all right, what's going to be in that? Well, first of all, what are the ingredients? The ingredients are electric field determined by charges and charges. And my charges will be quantum mechanical particles of mass m, little m. But I'll also introduce some very heavy static charges, infinitely heavy, nailed down, just to create an electric field. Think of them as a capacitor in one plus one dimensions. And a capacitor in one plus one dimensions, here's, here's a line. We put, let's say, a minus charge over here. No, let's put a plus charge over here and a minus charge over here. And that creates an electric field of one unit. Incidentally, I will work in units where the basic electric charge of both the heavy particles and the ordinary particles is one. And so we create a unit electric field that way. In space-time, let's put a time axis in. In the time axis, we have a charge over here. Oh, I forgot to put the charge. Did I not? The plus charge, let's see, plus charge over here, minus charge over here. Capacitor plate, infinitely big so that we don't have to worry about volume effects. And uh, the electric field is all over space and all over time, and it's uniform. Now, such a configuration is metastable. In order to discharge the field by creating a pair of particles, how would you do it? You would create a negative charge, let's say, over here. Perhaps you could create a pair of charges, a plus charge over here, a minus charge over here. And then the minus charge gets pulled toward the plus charge. The plus charge gets pulled toward the minus charge. And the region in between has no field because the plus and minus charges cancel each other out in the region in between and so forth. So we discharge the field in that way. And the problem is to calculate the rate. The rate for pair production. And the rate for pair production means the rate, the num the, the rate per unit space per unit time. In other words, well, exactly that. The rate per unit space per unit time for creating a pair. That problem was solved by Julian Schwinger a long, long time ago. By, uh, it's a beautiful paper, but it's a complicated paper. Today, it's been reduced to idiot work. You use the instanton calculus, and uh, it's even easier, much easier, in fact, than doing Feynman diagrams, which Schwinger always claimed was an invention of the devil for the purpose of letting idiots be able to do physics. <laughs> uh, this is even worse. Uh, <laughs> What? <laughs> Never mind. Uh, all right. The trick is to use instant times. Now, I'm going to show you the recipe, and then we're going to talk a little bit about why the recipe is the recipe, what it means. But uh, basically, this is recipe with a little bit of explanation. All right. So you calculate the decay rate by introducing an instant time. An instanton just, oh, oh, sorry, one step before we do that. We first replace Minkowski space by Euclidean space. T to IT, the usual prescription of T to IT. 
That doesn't change the fact that there's an electric field there. The electric field is still there. It just changes the fact that the vertical axis is now, uh, now a Euclidean direction as well as the horizontal action, axis. And you introduce an instanton. And an instanton, in this case, I'll tell you what it means. It means a circular configuration which is bounded by the Euclidean trajectory of a charged particle. The charged particle goes around in a circle. And over here, it's a positive charge. And over here, it's a negative charge. That will discharge the field in the center here. The plus charge and the minus charge will cancel each other. And in the center, the, uh, the charges they, uh, cancel. And there's no field in the center. The radius of this circle, the circle is, of course, y squared plus x squared is equal to some constant. Let's call it r squared, where r is the radius of the circle. And now let's calculate the action of this instanton, of this configuration. We'll calculate the action relative to a vacuum which contains the electric field. All right, so we'll call the zero point of action the, um, the configuration with the electric field. And then, since there's no electric field in here, we have lowered the action density in this hollow region here. So, if the electric field is E, the action density is E squared. The action is basically the integral over Euclidean space of the square of the electric field. But we've hollowed out a region with no electric field and so, relative to, the, uh, relative to the, let's call it the excited vacuum with electric field, the action contains a minus the area of the circle, pi r squared, if I remember my, uh, my uh, geometry, times the square of the electric field. That's one term. The second term is the action of the orbit or the action of the trajectory of the massive particle. The massive particle has m, mass m. The action of that is the mass m times the proper distance around the circle, which is plus twice 2 pi r m. And that's it. That's the whole action of the instanton. What do we integrate over? Well. In principle, we should integrate over all configurations of quantum electrodynamics. We should integrate over everything. But in this case, we just want to integrate over configurations like this. And the only integration that's going to be at all relevant to us is the integration over the size of the instanton. That's a variable that we can integrate over. The rest will take care of itself, and uh, we're not interested in it. OK, we want to integrate. What is it that we want to integrate? We want to integrate e to the minus the action, e to the minus s. We want to integrate that. And we want to integrate it over configurations, but now it just means integral over r. And obviously, the way to do it is saddle point. That's what instantons are. They're saddle points of the action. And to calculate the saddle point, we simply make this, we minimize this with respect to r. OK, so let's see if I can do that. Differentiating with respect to r gives minus 2 pi r e squared. Differentiating this one gives 2 pi m. And if I'm not mistaken, the 2 pi's cancel. We're going to set this equal to 0. So we're going to set this equal to this. And that determines the saddle point of the integration. It determines r. r is m over e squared. Question? What's that? It's a maximum. It's a maximum. I knew you were going to ask that. OK, why is it OK if it's a maximum? Because it has a negative mode, and that means it's a decay. But I wasn't going to say that to anybody, because I didn't want to confuse the audience about it. I was, I, all right, what Adam says is this, this, uh, this is a maximum of the action. And that means that you have to rotate the contour of R. Let's not get into it. Uh, if somebody asks me afterwards, I'll tell you what the meaning of that is. However, we can now calculate the action 
by plugging into here. So this gives us here 2 pi m times r, and m gives us m squared over e squared. This one gives us exactly the same thing except with a minus 1 coefficient. And so the whole thing is just pi m squared over e squared. The decay probability is the exponential of minus this action, or the decay rate, the decay per unit uh, space per unit time. There are prefactors. The prefactors come for the experts from calculating a determinant, and so forth and so on. But they're parametrically less interesting and less important. e to the minus the action is the analog of what in a previous lecture I called gamma. Yeah. Say it again. The difference between e and e in amplitude is the boundary, because I guess here I'm assuming that there's no inertia. There's a zero mode. Good. The zero mode, the zero mode is, of course, just the location of the instant time. There's no, instant, there's no zero mode associated with the radius of it. Indeed, indeed. But there's something very, very close to a zero mode. So in practice, you really would want to integrate over, over, the, over the position. And what you're saying is right. There isn't, strictly speaking, a, a zero mode. But if you make this region very big, it's an extremely flat direction. And you'd be making a bad mistake not to integrate over it. Uh, the integrating over the space-time region is just a statement that you are calculating the decay probability per unit space per unit time. So if you want the total decay probability, you have to integrate it over, uh, over location. OK. Um, now, let's, uh, let's examine in a, for a minute what it means. What it means is it has to do with vacuum decay. Think of the electric field as uh, providing an excited vacuum. And one of the ways you calculate a vacuum wave function is by Euclidean path integration. You start in the very remote past, and you integrate, you do a path integral over all fields up to some time zero. You do it in the Euclidean metric. That path integral, Juan used it for various purposes and so forth. That path integral, where you integrate the action, exponential of the action over fields, over configurations, from time minus infinity up to a time, let's call it t equals 0, uh, that path integral ha determines the amplitude for a given configuration at t equals 0. You put a boundary condition on at t equals 0. And now the boundary condition that we're putting on, that I want to imagine, is what is the contribution to the wave function of the vacuum of an electric field plus a virtual pair, plus a pair, an e plus e minus, separated by distance r. That's, if you like, chalk. That's what half of the path integral over the lower part of the half plane here is all about. It's the wave function for finding a pair of electrons, an electron pair, in this case separated by distance r, right? the stationary point or the dominant uh, contribution to that, uh, to that uh, wave function will be electrons separated by distance r. But what does the upper half mean? The lower half means psi. The upper half means psi star. Actually, in this case, the wave function is real. So calculating this times this and integrating over configurations in between is just calculating the probability, the probability that at time t equals 0, and of course it could be any time, that at time t equals 0, there is present in the vacuum a virtual pair. But notice something else. That virtual pair is static. It's not moving at time t equals 0. It's pointing vertically upward, the velocity vectors. So it's the probability of detecting or having in the wave function a pair of particles at rest at time t equals 0. That's what it is. 
All right, so we've computed a piece of the wave function of the vacuum, namely the piece, here it is, it's proportional to this. Uh, the wave function would have a factor of two downstairs because what we calculated was the full geometry. It would be half of it, which would correspond to the wave function, the full thing for the probability. Okay, big deal. What do we do with that? Well, what we do with that is we say we now know the probability to have a virtual pair separated by this distance. What's going to happen next? Next means next in real time. So let's start off with a virtual pair separated by that distance and now follow the system in Minkowski time, real Minkowski time. This positive, oh, sorry, this is a negative electron over here. It's pulled by the positive electron over here and so it's accelerated toward the positive electron over here. The negative one is accelerated did I get this right? No. The negative one is accelerated toward the positive one. The positive one is accelerated toward the negative one. The pair is pulled apart, and they move on accelerated trajectories till they hit the, uh, the capacitor plates and discharge the capacitor plates. Okay, can we calculate the trajectories? Yes, we can calculate the trajectories. It's very simple. We use the classical equations of motion, which is just minimizing the action for the trajectories, but here we've minimized the action for a trajectory in the Euclidean theory, minimizing the corresponding trajectories, here they are, minimizing the corresponding trajectories in the Minkowski metric is very simple. You simply replace y squared by minus t squared. You go from the, Minkowski, the Euclidean metric to the Minkowski metric, and exactly the same equation of motion which produced a circle over here will produce a hyperbola, a hyperbolic trajectory. Minus t squared plus x squared is equal to m, m squared, I guess, over e to the fourth, this being the radius squared. Notice, incidentally, that the radius of the bubble becomes bigger and bigger as the electric field gets smaller or as the mass gets larger. Uh, well, it's very hard to tunnel when mass is larger, when the electric field is small. You have to create a big bubble. You have to create a big uh, gap in here, and that costs you a lot of action. All right? So the bigger the mass, the harder it is to tunnel. The smaller the electric field, the harder it is to tunnel. Okay, that's the... Oh, well, yeah, okay, let's, uh, let's draw the picture now uh, on another blackboard. Let's draw the picture associated with those hyperbolas. If the tunneling happens at a particular location in space and time, let's draw some light cones at that point. And now the tunneling creates a pair of particles which move on time-like trajectories now this is just, these hyperbolas are just the hyperbolas that I've drawn here. Uh, where are they? Minus t squared plus x squared equals m squared over e to the fourth. One is a positive particle, the other is a negative particle. But of course, the lower half of this diagram doesn't mean anything. This is just the lower half of the diagram just represented the wave function or the contribution to the wave function which contained an electron or electron over here and a positron over here separated by distance r, what happens afterwards if such, a, if such a configuration exists, then it evolves in Minkowski space and the two particles separate. All right, now this region over here is not possible to really think of classically. This is the tunneling region. There's, um, you can't think of quantum, you can't draw quantum mechanical processes on the blackboard. A quantum mechanical process is a path integral, but once these guys get started, they move in pretty classical trajectories, and so you should think of some fuzziness about what goes on down here and not take too literally this slice through here which suddenly, simultaneously create the electron and the positron. Tunneling and instanton uh, calculations are always like this, 
In the past, you'll put in some Euclidean configuration. In the future, you let it run, you let it go and see what happens to it. And you should always imagine that what's taking place in here is sufficiently non-classical that the drawings on the blackboard in here are simply mnemonics to keep track of what's going on. All right, now what does this have to do with bubble nucleation? Well, in one plus one dimensions, a domain wall is just a particle. Right? So you can think of the electron and the positron as a dom each one of them as a domain wall separating a vacuum over here which has an electric field and over here which has an electric field from a region in here which has no electric field. And you can think of this as one of these bubble nucleations. Just uh, to remind you what would really happen in this situation is you wouldn't just nucleate one bubble. You would nucleate bubbles depending on the rate at characteristic distances and characteristic separations. And eventually, they all would come crashing together and discharge the entire capacitor, um, entire sample. It all come crashing together. That, as I explained at least one or two times ago, is not what happens at eternal inflation. In eternal inflation, space is itself accelerating outward fast enough that, uh, that in general, the bubbles won't catch up with each other and crash together. All right, so that's where we are. Now, um, now I want to come to coleman delucha instantons. You see what the recipe is, though. OK. I want to come to coleman delucha instantons, which are the instantons which mediate the decay of the sitter space when a lower energy de Sitter space is available or a zero uh, energy flat space is available to decay to. You can also decay sometimes to negative uh, cosmological constant. And I'll leave, that, uh, I'll leave that for another time. OK. The instantons we're considering are solutions of Euclidean equations of motion. And there's solutions of Euclidean equations of motion in which there's a scalar field, gravitation, ordinary gravitation, plus a scalar field with a potential which looks like so. And for simplicity, I'm going to take this minimum to be right at zero. Later on, we'll discuss what happens when it's not right at zero. So we'll be talking about a tunneling from a metastable vacuum over here to a vacuum with zero cosmological constant. Then we'll just add in, it's another one step uh, to add in a little bit of a cosmological constant over here. Okay, so we start out in here. That's like starting with the electric field, the, ex uh, the excited vacuum. And what we want to do is solve the Euclidean equations of motion for a configuration which is the analog of the instanton. All right, so let's write down a metric and then solve it. Let's consider the following metric. Now, T is going to be Euclidean time for the time being. I'm not going to introduce a separate symbol for Euclidean time and Minkowski time. When I want it to be Minkowski time, I will make it be Minkowski time. Voila, you are now Minkowski time. And I will try to tell you, though, when I do so. All right, so for the moment, uh, time is Euclidean time. And our metric is dt squared plus dt squared plus, this is a Euclidean Friedman Robertson Walker geometry plus A of T squared D omega 3 squared. In other words, the sphere, the unit sphere. Right? And A of T is time dependent. Right? The only thing unusual about it is that uh, T is Euclidean. Let's write down the FRW equations. First, I'll write down the ordinary ones, and then I'll make them Euclidean. OK, so we all know what they are. I hope we do. A dot over A squared is equal to the energy density. I'm going to leave out g's and pi's and 3's. In particular, I'm going to leave out 8 pi g over 3. Yeah, you see, I, I, I know it. <laughs> uh, all right, so it's equal to the energy density, which is phi dot squared over 2. Uh, plus V of phi. And then there's a curvature term, 
And we're going to take the case of positive curvature, which positive curvature, I think, means uh, negative k, uh, negative uh, 1 over a squared here. Is that right? I think it's net 1 over a squared. I always, I always forget what the sign is, and I have to think about it. OK. What's the other equation? The other equation is the equation for phi, which is phi double dot plus 3 phi dot times a dot over a, cosmic friction, is equal to minus dv d phi. The, say it again. Not yet, not yet, not yet. This is Euclidean. No, this is Minkowski so far. Oh, I'm sorry. I said I would first, I'm going to do this in two steps. We'll get to here by first, yes, thank you. I first wrote down the conventional ones, and now I will change the signs that correspond to t goes to i t. And it's very simple. Every time you have a thing with two time derivatives, it changes sign. t goes to i t, d by dt squared goes to r minus d by dt squared. So it changes the sign of this, it changes the sign of this, it doesn't change the sign of this, and it doesn't change the sign of this. But by a mathematical trick, we can just change the sign of these two terms. OK, so that becomes the Euclidean FRW equation for the scale factor. And the same thing for the equation of motion for, um, for phi. We change the sign of these two terms, two time derivatives, and leave this one alone. Or it takes less effort to just change the sign of the right-hand side. The net effect. Uh, a change, uh, first of all, a change in the sign of the 1 over a squared term, okay, uh, effectively changes the sign of curvature, but uh, mostly the important thing is an effective change in the sign of the potential. So what we're doing then is a kind of cosmological problem or solving equations of motion with a potential which is upside down. Take this potential, turn it over, I will now turn it over, and it becomes the potential for, uh, for the equations of motion uh, uh, of a and phi. And the, youth, the, the potential now looks like this. Here's the bottom, here was what was the bottom of the potential. Here is what was the excited state. And let's call, uh, let's call this position A, and let's call this position B. All right, now the kind of solution that we're going to look for is called a bounce solution. It's a solution which is um, a compact space with, in fact, the topology of a four sphere. Oh, before I mention that, let me just remind you what the Euclidean description of de Sitter space is. The Euclidean description of de Sitter space is just a four sphere. It's just a four sphere. There it is, there's a four sphere. It is just a four sphere. And that's what you get if you just consider the situation, no tunneling, just sitting in the excited vacuum phi A. Just a static solution, or just a solution of the equations, not static, but if, uh, if uh, you were trapped at the bottom of this potential. Right? If you were trapped at the bottom of the potential, you would have a cosmological constant, and you would have a, uh, a four sphere as your geometry. What happens next is we're going to consider a solution which is a deformation of this. You start over here in the neighborhood of A, not at A, but at some place called A prime, which is nearby. You, here's the elements, you let the ball go, it goes down here, it experiences some friction, but then on the way back up, a dot over A is going to change sign, and it will experience some anti-friction. In any case, it will go down to here, go up to some point, stop because it's run out of energy, turn around, and come back to that point. Meanwhile, the scale factor will go from being zero, start increasing, turn around, and collapse again. The scale factor of the sphere in this language in this language, t runs this way. 
and the scale factor starts zero over here, it starts to expand and comes back and collapses. I've intentionally drawn the time axis horizontal, incidentally, uh, for reasons that will become clear eventually. All right, so just the sitter space by itself just sitting here, the field does nothing, the, um, the scale factor increases and then collapses, and the whole thing forms a perfect sphere. This is a deformation of it, where you start over here, you go up, and you come back down. Now, the reason you don't start at the top is because if you started right at the top, you would just sit at the top, all right? You would sit forever at the top. You have to start part way down in order to complete the cycle in a finite amount of time. We're expecting the cycle to be completed in a finite amount of time because the geometry is a compact deformation of a four sphere. Right? So you start away from the top, go down, come back up. The boundary conditions, let me write the boundary conditions now. And in fact, it takes a certain amount of time to complete the cycle. Let's call that time T naught. All right, so what are the boundary conditions? The boundary conditions are that phi dot at, this is A prime, this is A, this is B, this is A prime, and this is B prime. So the tunneling, the, the, uh, the minima are at A and B, but the tunneling goes, or the tunneling trajectory goes from A prime to B prime. All right, so starting at A prime, the boundary conditions are phi dot equals zero, phi dot of A prime or B prime equals zero. And there are at least two reasons. Um, first of all, take B prime. This is the bounce geometry where you go up this high and then come back down. Obviously, phi dot is zero at the, uh, at the top of the trajectory over here. So that's one boundary condition. What about at A over here? Well, let's call, let's think of this point over here as A prime. That's where we're starting. Um, if phi is gonna be a continuous function, this, this sphere is, uh, is deformed now, but if the sphere is, if we start at this point over here and it's nice and smooth, then the derivative of phi with respect to proper distance along the surface here has to be zero at this point just by smoothness at this point here, and that tells you that uh, phi dot at A prime and B prime is equal to zero. What about little a? Little a, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that on the surface of a smooth surface, starting at a point and looking about how the uh, scale factor increases as you move away from that point, the scale factor increases linearly with distance as you move along there. That's just saying the radius, of, uh, the radius of a little circle or a little disk there increases linearly with the distance, uh, with the radial distance here. And that tells you the other boundary condition, the other boundary condition is that a dot at t equals zero is one, but at the other end of the sphere where you're contracting, a dot has to be minus one. This is enough boundary conditions to not only determine the solution, but also to determine how long the solution takes to go from here to here. Completely determines the bounce geometry. Bounce geometry because uh, you've uh, expanded and recontracted. And there's some solution. The solution has an action. We're not gonna solve these equations. There's no point in solving these equations. We just wanna write them down to know that they exist and to get some picture of what's going on. And the tunneling takes place between here and here. So let's draw the picture, the, the Euclidean picture. The geometry no longer has the symmetry of the four sphere, but it does have the symmetry of a three sphere. The symmetry of a four sphere is O5. The symmetry of a four sphere the symmetry of a four sphere is O5. The symmetry of a three sphere is O4. The original De Sitter space had O5 symmetry. That's because it could be embedded in five dimensions. The, uh, the new instanton has a reduced symmetry, 
and the reduced symmetry is O4, and you can, it sort of looks like this. It's, a, it's more or less spherical over here, corresponding to the fact that it looks pretty much like the sitter space to begin with, and then it tunnels out, and in the particular example we're doing, it gets to something near flat space over here. So if it's flat space, let's just draw this flat space after a while. After a while, it flattens out. The, it spends a lot of time being pretty much the sitter space, and then it spends a lot of time being near flat space, but in the region in between where the tunneling takes place, that's the domain wall. That corresponds to the domain wall. If we turn the potential right side up, it corresponds to the event of tunneling through the potential from A prime to B prime. And tunneling through the potential, that happens fast typically, and that's the domain wall. The domain wall is somewhere over here and here. Let me draw this in, a in one higher dimension so that you can look at it. This is the domain wall, and it's a three-sphere. It's a three-sphere. So it's sort of sewing together a four-sphere over here and a piece of a plane, approximately a piece of a plane. It's not exactly a piece of a plane, but it has less curvature because it's closer to flat space up in here. Okay, that's, the, uh, that's what the instant time looks like. It has a action, which we're not gonna compute, uh, and it's that action which is going to determine the, um, the decay rate. All right, let me just, I think I don't need this picture anymore. Uh, this, uh, this over here, what I need is the picture. So, Let's label this point over here A prime and this point over here B prime. Right, the tunneling going from A prime to B prime. Uh, yeah. All right. Look at it face on for a second. Now I'm going to show why, why did I draw this thing? Why didn't I put this up on the top? Everybody always draws this piece up here on the top because they think of it as tunneling with time going from A prime to B prime, but that's not the right way to draw it. The right way to draw it is this. This circle over here is analogous to the electron-positron trajectory. This region in here is analogous to the region with no electric field, lower energy, and the rest of the instanton is natural to identify with the, uh, with the, rest of spa with the excited space out here. Now, just as cutting through here had the meaning of multiplying psi coming from a path integral below here to psi star, which corresponds to a path integral above here, the same thing is true here. If you slice it through here, then the lower half of this is part of the hartle hawking wave function. The thing that you get, I think, uh, did Juan spoke about the hartle hawking wave function a little bit? I think he did. But the idea is you put boundary conditions on the surface at t equals zero, or on the surface halfway between the top and the bottom, and you path integrate over all configurations in the lower part here to find the wave function. And in this case, it's the wave function for having the original de Sitter space plus a bubble in it, a bubble of flat space, a bubble of flat space just big enough to go from here to here. That's what this picture is, and you should slice it this way to think of the part of the path integral which sets up the wave function in the past, but then what you do with it afterwards is you solve the Minkowski equations. Once you have the wave function, you solve the Minkowski equations. All right, so the, the output of this kind of calculation is two things. It's an action which determines the rate, and it's an initial starting configuration from which you integrate off using the Minkowski equations of motion. 
All right, the way I'm going to do this is not, I'm not going to derive the Minkowski continuation by doing analytic continuation. I'm going to draw the picture and then show you how it relates to this in words and in pictures. What does the Minkowski continuation of this geometry look like? And incidentally, the time that we're continuing in is a time which goes around this way. One of, the, one of the angular variables going around in this direction is being selected as time, and then time is going to go to i times time. Okay, so I'll show you what it looks like, and then I'll show you how it relates to this picture here. Oh, before I do that, one point about the electron-positron. Uh, we said, here's the instanton, and here's the center of the instanton, and it was the center of polar coordinates x squared plus y squared equals r squared. What happens to the center of polar coordinates when you go from Euclidean to Minkowski? The answer is the center of polar coordinates becomes light cone. Whoops. Yes. Turns into a light cone. It turns into the um, x squared minus t squared. Well, sorry, the center of, polar, the center of coordinates is x squared plus y squared equals zero, equals zero. That's the center of coordinates. And the center of coordinates under continuation to Minkowski space makes this minus t squared, and it just becomes light cone. OK, that is what will happen to the poles of the sphere over here. The poles of the sphere, this one and this one, will turn into light cones. Let me draw for you what the Penrose diagram looks like for the analytic continuation of this geometry to Minkowski signature. And then I'll show you how to read it. Uh, not to, I'll begin with this pole and this pole, what I called last time, I think, the west pole and the east pole of the sphere. Okay, And those turn into light cones. Those turn into light-like trajectories. Now, on a Penrose diagram, they're just a light cone over here, or light-like directions over here, which begin at this point B prime. And now we, let's move along T equals zero. Let's move along the horizontal slice here. Starting over here, let's take a little walk out to the domain wall and then around to A. That's starting here, and we're walking out to the domain wall and around here, and what do we see? Well. We start here, and we start to move away from the domain wall. Space is flat, so there's a flat region in here. Let me not label it. Then I hit the domain wall. And here's the domain wall over here. The domain wall was a circle over here. It will be a hyperboloid over here, and it will look like that. That's the domain wall. But we keep walking, and we eventually walk around to A prime, A prime is also a pole. A pole, I don't mean a pole in the sense of uh, 1 over x. I mean a pole in the sense of uh, the uh, pole of a sphere. And that's A prime. And the analytic, the obvious analytic continuation of this is just the region within a diamond, like that. As you walk along the horizontal axis, you walk from B prime to A prime. The pole at A prime becomes a light cone. The pole at B prime also becomes a light cone. You have more or less flat space time in here, not exactly, but you have uh, the flatter region in here, and you have more or less the De Sitter region in here. They're not quite, uh, as we'll see in a moment, not quite. But we're not finished. And the reason we're not finished is this geometry is not geodesically complete. Nothing happens at this light cone. You can pass right through it. It's just a, uh, it's just a light cone. Uh, Pass to the light cone. It's, it's not the end of the world. It's not the asymptotic future. It's just a light cone. Let's think about what happens at B prime if you move vertically upward in Minkowski space. All right. So where were you in B prime? Let me redraw the potential. Right side up. Here's the potential right side up. I think I've exceeded my 10 minutes that I was going to spend on this problem, haven't I? OK. Uh, 
which was a prime and b prime. This is, yeah, okay, here is b prime over here, and here is a prime over here. A prime is in the A prime, capital A prime. Okay. Now let's think in Minkowski space. Supposing you started at this point with zero velocity. You start at that point with zero velocity. The derivative of a field in the neighborhood of this point is supposed to be zero. That was one of the boundary conditions. Uh, and you let the ball go. What happens to it? Oh, I, oh, I'm over here. Sorry, B prime, B prime. What happens to B prime if you drop it? It falls down to here. Cosmic friction slows it down, and it just ends over here. In flat space, zero cosmological constant. What happens if you drop the ball from here? You fall down to here, and you go to the sitter space. So let's start at A prime. Let's start here and work our way upward in Minkowski space. What do we expect? We expect the field to go from A prime to A. And over here, what we have is the sitter space. So what this is going to look like is the field will go from A prime to A. And then on a Penrose diagram, we should connect to the asymptotic future of the sitter space. The asymptotic future of the sitter space on the Penrose diagram is just a horizontal line. The metric blows up as you get closer and closer to this. But the same thing happens as you go into the past. Work your way into the past. The time symmetry of these equations gives you a, gives you a figure which looks like this. Way out here, it's very close to the sitter space because you're practically down at the bottom. You're sort of at the sitter space over here, but not quite because the field will roll down to here and it'll roll down to here a short distance. More interesting is what, well, I don't know, it's interesting. But equally interesting is what happens over here. B prime goes down to flat space. So that means the upper part of this diagram, the asymptotic future, has to somehow be a piece of the Penrose diagram of flat space time. And that, I didn't leave myself enough room. I'll redraw it over here. But it's a piece of flat space. Flat space looks like this. And basically, we're cutting out a piece of approximately flat space. Not quite. Well, quite not quite, because the field is still rolling. And we have that, and we have that. That's the Penrose diagram that goes with the analytic continuation of this instant time. So let me redraw it over here. These are just guidelines over here, just to draw the picture. Oh, let me put it back in. OK. This diagram consists of five parts, five pieces. One, two, three, four, and five. We're going to, the part that we're interested in, incidentally, is the upper half of this diagram. The reason we're interested in the upper half is it has to do with the tunneling products, just as the upper half of the E plus E minus diagram was the Minkowski evolution of the electron-positron pair. The upper half of this diagram is the evolution after the tunneling takes place. The lower half, of course, should really be replaced by the original de Sitter space, uh, so I don't know how to draw this. There's no nice way to draw it. Just the, I'm not gonna, I, I'm gonna leave it that way for the time being. Um, this diagram corresponds to the electron-positron bounce, which we cut off and said it was only the upper half of this, which was physically the result of the tunneling amplitude. The lower half was unphysical. Same thing here. The sitter space decays to the upper half. Now, this region still looks like the original de Sitter space, more or less. So does this region over here, although there's a domain wall which separates it from a region which is flatter. This region over here is the bubble, is the bubble that was nucleated. 
the bubble of approximately flat space. And it's the geometry and structure of region one that I want to get at. All right, any questions? Yes? You have to yell because I'm half deaf. Mostly I'm half deaf from hearing myself talk. Sure, it does here too. So is I'm sure there is. I'm sure, I'm sure the, uh, the details of what happens do depend on the details of, uh, of the starting point. Um, we're talking, roughly speaking, we're talking about dependence on initial conditions. And dependence on initial conditions is something if I have time, I will want to spend some time at because initial conditions do play a role in the story, the dependence on initial conditions. But for the time being, let's, uh, let's suppose that the decay rate is sufficiently small uh, so that uh, transients go away and uh, you see more or less exponential decay, All right. and that it's not terribly dependent on initial conditions. All right, so let's, let's see what we can learn. And in particular, the thing I'm interested in is the, surface of, the surfaces of constant field, constant inflaton, or should we call this the inflaton? I guess we can call it the inflaton. It's not the usual inflaton. Uh, let's just call it the tunneling potential. Surfaces of constant tunneling potential, what do they look like here? So if we go back to the sphere, which looks like sort of like that, the surfaces of constant field are just the circles which look like this. There's a symmetry. As I said, this figure has a symmetry, and the symmetry is O4. Four dimension, why only O4? Because the full O5 symmetry of the sphere is broken by the misshapen uh, structure of it. But it does have O4 symmetry, which is rotations around here, and of course, the surfaces of constant field will be orbits of the O4 symmetry. In other words, um, any points which are related by O4 transformations should have the same value of the field. And so the field has lines of constant field which look like this. The question is, what happens to the symmetry group O4 when you do the analytic continuation? Some variable has gone to I times itself x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus u squared goes to x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus t squared. The symmetry group is going to go from O4 to O31. Is it called O31 or O13? Who cares? Hmm? O31. O31. And that means Lorentz transformations in four dimensions. Lorentz transformations in four dimensions. It's a non-compact group, and the orbits of the non-compact group are infinite, and what are they? They're basically hyperbolic. So let me show you on these diagrams how the O4 symmetry acts. I think I need another color, yeah, uh, pink. The analogs of these circles here. In region two, the O4 symmetry acts, the orbits of it are time-like. That means the inflaton field is constant along these pink lines. And across here, it's jumping between A prime and B prime, or roughly speaking, from uh, A to B, as we go from here to here. However, in regions 3, 1, 4, and 5, oops, regions 3, 1, 4, and 5, the orbits of the group are space-like, and they look like this. The inflaton field and also in here. So That means that space-like surfaces of a particular kind, they're hyperbolic slicing hyperboloids embedded in this flat space-time or approximately flat space-time. Hyperbolic geometries in there have the property that the inflaton field is constant along them. 
In other words, these are the natural surfaces of constant time for cosmological purposes. Notice that they're infinite. The metric up here diverges. Why does it diverge? Well, the sitter space over here, the, uh, you know, the line element diverges up near the top of the de Sitter space. The metric is infinite along here. It's also infinite along here. There's a lot of volume, space-time volume. And in particular, it's also infinite along here. So these hyperboloids are infinite sections, infinite uh, space-like sections. We're talking then about some kind of cosmology in here which has infinite open hyperbolic space-like surfaces of constant time, constant field. All right. uh, what could it be? Well, it's pretty obvious what it is. It's open FRW, K equals minus 1, open FRW with hyperbolic uh, space. And I'll write the metric for it. This is the metric in region 1. Let's write it over here. Now it's minus dt squared plus some a of t squared. Now the a which appears in here is the, as a function of this time here, is the analytic continuation of the a that was used in the, in the Euclidean version. We continued a, and now we have to continue a along the time-like direction here. But whatever it is, it's some kind of a of t. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. It's a of t squared times d omega, no, not d omega, d h3 squared, where h3 squared is the hyperbolic uniformly curved, negative curved space. I'll write it over here, d h3 is equal, this is a unit uh, hyperboloid, dr squared plus cinch squared r d omega 2 squared. All right, what is r? The observer living at the center, what I'll nominally call the center of this FRW region over here, looks out and has a radial variable, basically radial proper distance along these hyperboloids radial proper distance along the hyperboloids, and that I've called R. There's another, th there's another, what, uh, anybody know, there's another notation for it? Uh, sometimes people call it C or A, I, I can't remember, some Greek uh, symbol. All right, but it's, it's radial distance rescaled with the scale factor scaled out of it, rescaled radial distance to a distance R away from you, and omega 2, for that observer at the center, is just the sky. It's just the two-sphere of the sky. And that's the geometry which isn't here. It's perfectly conventional FRW negative curved space, space-time. There's only one thing unusual about it. There's no, oh, incidentally, where is scale factor A equals 0? Scale factor A equals 0 is over here. And in fact, this whole light cone over here is A equals 0 over here. So as you move away from that light cone, time is evolving in the FRW sense. The scale factor begins 0, increases along these surfaces, and eventually goes off to infinity. To infinity, it's open FRW. It's not closed FRW, with 0 cosmological constant in this case just because I chose it to be zero cosmological constant. Uh, how are we doing? Oh, boy. This, my 10 minutes is long past. OK, so this is the geometry that is produced by the coleman Lucha instanton. Now, I've placed the nucleation point right at the center here. It's not true, of course, that all bubbles in the Sitter space necessarily nucleate at time t equals 0. There's a symmetry, or it's actually not a symmetry, not a symmetry of this picture, but you can rotate the picture and move where the nucleation point is. You can move it up and down along here, 
That corresponds to moving it vertically up and down along here. The nucle there's a time translation symmetry in the sitter space. You can move the nucleation point up or down. So let me show you what it looks like if you move the nucleation point up. And let's replace the bottom half of the diagram by the undecayed the sitter space. All right, so it looks pretty much like what you might expect the bubble nucleation to look like. Instead of nucleating over here, I'm going to have it nucleated at a late time. So it nucleates here, and it looks like that. Here it is. Here is its space-like surfaces. Incidentally, surfaces of constant r, or lines of constant r, orbits of, uh, of observers look like this. As you move out toward that point, that's going to larger and larger r. OK, so it's a, it's a kind of fun situation where bubbles that nucleate inside compact, finite the sitter spaces are themselves infinite geometries, infinite. The infinity comes because the space-like surface goes up, migrates up to, to a large time. Good. I think I've said everything I want to say about uh, Let's just see if there's any other point that I wanted to make. Oh, hold on just a second. Yeah, looks, looks good. Okay, yeah. Say it again. Yes. Well, the A equal, oh, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what to say about it. Uh, um, there's a critical bubble size, which is this over here, but uh, strictly speaking, the critical bubble size is not A equals zero. A equals zero corresponds to this. Um, can you uh, rephrase the question? Yeah. Yes? One of these hyperboloids is the domain wall. Or the domain wall is, of course, not a, not a sharp thing. Right. No. 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 It's in region two. It's in region two, and it's not part of the FRW geometry. Perfectly smooth. Perfectly smooth. Per it's, 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 uh, not, um, it's not flat space, but it's perfectly smooth. One should point out that this is a, um, a counterexample to the statement that FRW geometries will crunch in the past. This corresponds to a, spe from the point of FRW geometry, it corresponds to a very fine tuned initial condition which allows it not to have a singularity in the past. Now, that fine tuning was not made by anybody in the future here uh, saying I have to make sure it was fine tuned. It's automatically fine tuned by the, uh, by the, um, by the mathematics of the decay. Another way to see that it's fine tuned, here's another way to see that it's fine tuned. Remember when you come out from the decay over here, you come out with phi dot equal to zero. Remember, that was one of the boundary conditions that at the other end of the decay over there, phi dot is equal to zero. So that means that your initial condition at A equals zero is that phi is right on the side of this potential with zero derivative. It's at rest. So the cosmology of what goes on in this region here is the cosmology of a inflaton. So far, it's not much of an inflaton, but uh, cosmology of a scalar field which starts at rest. Okay? And that fine tuning, starting at rest, ensures that there's no singularity at this point over here along this whole light cone. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, how does this change if you uh, go to the 
let's, let's leave it, 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 it would eventually end up in a crunch. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, let's ask, ask the question first about the sitter. All right. So for the sitter, what you do is you paste this on, not onto a flat region, but onto a region with a larger spherical radius, a lower cosmological de Sitter space. And the effect of that will be to take this FRW patch here and replace it by an FRW patch with a positive cosmological constant. All right. I'll tell you what that does. It's simply, in terms of the uh, Penrose diagram, it truncates the Penrose diagram like that. Why? Because the infinite time future of the sitter space is space-like, but of course the metric now blows up as you get closer and closer to this, uh, to this surface over here. So a tunneling to the sitter space would look very similar. The only difference from the uh, Penrose diagram point of view is it would cut off over here. That incidentally would say, for example, that an observer up at the top here doesn't get to see everything within the FRW patch. Whereas if the FRW patch were flat up here, an observer up at sufficiently late time would see the entire surface of last scattering, for example. One of these surfaces is the surface of last scattering. Okay. Uh, I think what I will talk about next is just uh, get epsilon closer to phenomenology. Just epsilon, I'm not a phenomenologist and I don't pretend to be one. But the question is, how does all of this fit into conventional cosmology? Well, as it stands, it doesn't. As it stands, just the way it's set up, it doesn't fit in very well. And the reason is because there may have been inflation in this vacuum over here, but there was no inflation in here. You tunneled out, yeah, you can see this. You tunneled out from here and then slid down the hill. As you slid down the hill here, things were very curvature dominated. What does that mean? Remember that when you slide out from here, the boundary condition is that a dot is equal to one or something. A dot is equal to one. That was one of the boundary conditions actually coming in from this side, but it's the same going this way. A dot is equal to one, or equivalently, a is equal to t. At small times in this diagram here, the scale factor is just proportional to time. And that means that a dot over a is 1 over t. Sorry, no, forget a dot over a. It means 1 over a squared is 1 over t squared. Well, that's bigger than anything else in the FRW equation of motion. It's the biggest thing in the FRW equation of motion uh, back here. And so the system is curvature dominated. This is the curvature term in the FRW equation. And because it's curvature dominated, I'll just remind you what curvature means, negative curvature, what negative curvature means in, uh, in FRW or in uh, Newtonian cosmology. Newtonian cosmology, uh, the analog of negative curvature is that everything is shot out with larger than the escape velocity. That's what negative curvature means. Positive curvature, things are shot out with less than the escape velocity, so they crash back, ignoring a cosmological constant, forgetting cosmological constant. Um, positive curvature, less than uh, escape velocity. Zero curvature, just escape velocity. Negative curvature, faster than the escape velocity. And if you're not careful, everything gets shot out and there's no chance of structure formation. Kinetic energy will just uh, overwhelm the system and you go flying out. That's what will happen pretty much inevitably in a situation like that. The large curvature domination just means everything gets shot out of a cannon and uh, no, curv no, uh, no structure formation. You have to dilute that curvature. If you want to have it's going to be an empty universe. It's going to be just basically a totally empty universe, uh, or practically empty. You want to do something to dilute that curvature, curvature while there's still a finite energy density. 
That's what inflation does. That's what inflation does. But to have it, you have to have a bizarre looking potential. The potential has to do something like this. This is a cartoon, of course. It, it may be a little bit of a cosmological constant over here. That's not the important thing. You have to have the property that when you tunnel out of here, the curvature domination gives way after a period of time to vacuum energy domination. If it gives way to vacuum energy domination, that's called inflation. It'll inflate along here for a while and then reheat. So you need a situation like that. In other words, you need inflation in here, not out here. That doesn't do you anything. You need inflation up here to a reheating surface. And you have to have enough inflation that you dilute the curvature enough so that galaxies can form. You can make an estimate. Oh, incidentally, curvature does one nice thing for you as you're rolling down here. There's a famous problem called the overshoot problem. The overshoot problem is the fact that this energy here is very small, and it's very easy to overshoot the minimum of the potential here, to overshoot the inflating region here. Negative curvature, in particular, the curvature domination here, let's see what it does. It puts into the equation of motion for the scalar field an a dot over a times phi dot times 3. It puts in cosmic uh, friction. And the cosmic friction, a is t, a dot, what's a dot over a? 1 over t squared? 1 over t or 1 over t squared? Uh, a dot is 1, 1 over t. So it gives you a load of curvature, uh, gives you a load of cosmic friction at early times. When you fall off here, it is really sticky, gooey stuff. The negative curvature and the curvature domination is very strong effect, and it really slows this point down. If this distance is about a Planck distance in field space, it slows it down basically to rest in about a tenth of the distance. So the negative curvature is useful in this situation, but it was a bad story when you didn't have the inflationary thing here. All right, so, uh, to finish up, I'll just mention some uh, phenomenological, possible phenomenological aspects of this. Um, the first prediction of this kind of eternal inflation, incidentally, yesterday I talked about several different phases of eternal inflation. I talked about this island, that island, tubular phase, and so forth. We are now very much concentrating on the dead island phase, the phase where the regions of reheated are island-like, the bubble nucleation region. It is not that we know for sure that we're not in one of these other phases. We don't. Uh, it would be very interesting if we were, but, uh, but we don't know. It's just very hard to analyze the other ones. So it's, you know, it's lamppost physics. You go where the light is, and where the light is, is it's much easier to, to uh, study the bubble nucleation than it is the horrible tubular phase and the even more horrible uh, island phases, other island phase. OK, so um, yeah, the first, yeah. The only thing that's what? Is the only thing that's compatible with the um, with space and motion control orbit? No. I mean, I think there are, it doesn't imply that. No, of course not. I, I, I have assumed slow roll inflation, right? Um, DBI inflation is another possibility, right? But whatever it is, whatever it is, you need an ingredient over here to slow things down. It could be DBI, it could be, uh, you know what DBI is. I don't know, I can't see, uh, I don't have my glasses on, I can't see who you are. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so no, the main ingredient is you need an inflationary mechanism that operates up in here, not out here. 
The bubble nucleation is important if you think there's a landscape and you want to know how the landscape was populated. The, it does not serve the role as, as a substitute for ordinary inflation. Why should you have such a thing? Well, you can calculate, and I, I have calculated together with Freivogel and Claiborne and Martinez, um, what are the anthropic restrictions on how big this plateau has to be? Or how many E-foldings? Uh, and how many e the longer this plateau is, the more E-foldings of inflation you will have. The more E-foldings, the more the negative curvature gets diluted. The more it gets diluted, the better chance you have of making structure. The structure argument is very closely related to Weinberg's structure argument. Instead of um, a cosmological constant giving you an outward force which prevents uh, 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 um, structure, kinetic energy associated with negative curvature gives you the outward thrust that prevents uh, uh, structure. And you can ask, what's the minimum number of E-foldings, not that is consistent with observation, but that's consistent with enough dilution that galaxies and uh, structure can form. Well, if you say the observed bound is 62 E-foldings, and of course this is a somewhat arbitrary number. Uh, let's say 60. I hate 62. 60. Let's say 60 E-foldings is the ordinary observational bound, then 57.5, 57.5, Point five e foldings is the anthropic or the structure bound. So that doesn't mean that the real number of e foldings is somewhere between 57.5 and 60. What it simply means is that the observed bound, the observed bound, not the observed value, the observed bound on a number of e foldings of slow roll inflation is not much larger. Than the, uh, than the anthropic bound or the, um, or the structure bound coming from requiring uh, structure formation. That's suggestive. It's suggestive. It's suggestive that the reason that we have to be operating in a region of the landscape that has such a structure here is simply anthropic, that without such a structure here, we simply wouldn't have enough e-foldings to, uh, to allow structure to form. Uh, we could get a little more quantitative about this. I don't want to do it today. It's, uh, it's uh, getting late. And, uh, oh, yeah. If the number of E-foldings is not much larger than 60, then we have a chance of seeing the remnant curvature of space, negative curvature or, po or positive curvature. The chance is not high, I would say. Uh, I would say it's rather low, in fact. But the important point is this theory is um, falsifiable. It may be hard to confirm. It's also hard to falsify if it's hard to confirm. But in principle, it is falsifiable. If positive curvature is measured at the level of 10 to the minus 3, or possibly, I don't know, is 10 to the minus 4 going to be in our future? Uh, 10 to the minus, not 10 to the minus 5. 10 to the minus 5, just random fluctuations would give curvature of order 10 to the minus 5. Uh, but if there's curvature at the level of 10 to the minus 3 and it's positive curvature, it would be very, very difficult to live with this, uh, with this bubble nucleation. I don't know how you would do it. I think that would falsify it. So positive curvature would be, in my mind, a falsification of this picture. And the prediction is that if curvature is detected, it will be negative curvature. There are other signals. There are one or two other um, possible phenomenological or observational signals that are possible, most of them having to do with bubble collisions, other bubbles nucleating over here colliding with our bubble and lighting up little patches in the sky. But I'm not an expert in that, and uh, that's uh, so for somebody else to talk about, not me. OK, I think we're finished for today. I got about halfway through my lecture notes. Tomorrow, I will talk about the notorious measure problem and, uh, and maybe some other theoretical aspects of this.